Good day everyone, this is Dr. Sofer here, and today we'll be discussing how to work with multiple worksheets and use conditional formatting in Microsoft Excel. Let's begin by taking a look at the five topics that we will address in this video. First, we'll learn several different methods for creating new worksheets in a Microsoft Excel workbook. After that, we'll learn a few different ways of duplicating or creating copies of an Excel worksheet. Next, we'll learn how to rename existing worksheets in a Microsoft Excel workbook. In our fourth topic, we will learn about 3D referencing, and we will see examples of how to use 3D referencing in Excel. Finally, we will conclude our video by learning how to use conditional formatting in Excel. In order to facilitate our exploration of these five topics, we will be using an Excel workbook that contains viewership data for three of the greatest animated shows ever made, namely Archer, South Park, and Futurama. Let's get started. As with most things in Excel, there are several different methods that we can use to create a new worksheet. Specifically, we can use the Insert Sheet option on the Home ribbon, the Shift F11 shortcut, or we can simply click on the New Sheet icon. Let's see examples of these three different techniques. Here we see a simple worksheet which contains spaces for us to record the average number of viewers per episode for three animated television programs. As we can see at the top of the worksheet, these data are intended to refer to viewership figures for the year 2011. Let's imagine that we want to create a new worksheet where we can enter similar data for the year 2012. One way of adding a new worksheet to the workbook is by clicking on the Insert drop-down box on the Home ribbon and then selecting the Insert Sheet option. As you can see, Excel has added a new empty worksheet to our workbook. Another way of creating a new worksheet is by using the Shift F11 shortcut. As you can see, when I press the Shift and F11 keys together, Excel adds a new empty worksheet to our workbook. Perhaps the most intuitive way of adding a new worksheet to the workbook, however, is simply by clicking on the New Sheet icon which is located in the lower left-hand corner of the Excel interface. As you can see, every time that I click on the New Sheet icon, Excel adds a new worksheet to the current workbook. Next, let's learn how to create copies of an existing Excel worksheet. Excel provides us with several different ways of duplicating or making a copy of an existing worksheet. Specifically, we can use the Move or Copy dialog box, or we can use the Control-Drag method. Let's see examples of both of these techniques. Here's a simple worksheet that will allow us to record the average number of viewers per episode for three animated television programs for the year 2011. Let's imagine that we want to create new worksheets where we can enter similar data for the years 2012 and 2013, and that we want to copy all of the formatting and structure of the current worksheet so that the new worksheets will look exactly the same. To do this, we simply need to make a copy or a duplicate of the current worksheet. One way of making a copy of the worksheet is by clicking on the Format drop-down box on the Home ribbon and then selecting the Move or Copy Sheet option. After doing this, the Move or Copy dialog box will appear. At the bottom of this dialog box is a checkbox labeled Create a Copy. By selecting this option and then clicking on the OK button, Excel will create an exact copy of the current worksheet. Note that we can also cause the Move or Copy dialog box to appear by right clicking on the name of the sheet that we wish to duplicate and then selecting the Move or Copy option. Rather than using the previous approach, a much faster but more advanced way of making a copy of an existing worksheet is by using the Control-Drag method. To use this method, 
we simply need to hold down the control key, click on the name of the worksheet that we wish to duplicate, and while holding down the left mouse button, drag the mouse cursor to the location where we want the new worksheet tab to appear. This is certainly the fastest way to create a copy of a worksheet, but getting the method to work properly can take a bit of practice. Next, we'll learn a few different ways of renaming an Excel worksheet. There are several different ways to rename a worksheet in Microsoft Excel. Specifically, we can use the Rename Sheet option on the Home ribbon, we can use the right-click Rename method, or we can simply double-click on the worksheet name. Let's see examples of these three techniques. As we can see, our workbook contains three worksheets, each of which is intended to allow us to enter viewership information for three different animated shows during a given year. The names of our worksheets, however, are a bit confusing, so let's rename them so that the name of each worksheet refers to the year of its associated viewership data. Beginning with the worksheet for the year 2011, we can rename the worksheet by clicking on the Format drop-down box on the Home ribbon, and then selecting the Rename Sheet option. The name of the worksheet will then become highlighted on its associated worksheet tab, and we can change the name simply by typing the new name and pressing Enter. The second way in which we can rename a worksheet in Microsoft Excel is to right-click on the name of the worksheet whose name we wish to change, and then select the Rename option. Just as before, the name of the worksheet becomes highlighted, allowing us to type the new name for the worksheet. Finally, perhaps the easiest way to change the name of the worksheet in Microsoft Excel is simply by double-clicking on the worksheet's current name. By double-clicking on the worksheet's name, the name becomes highlighted, and we can type a new name for the worksheet just as we did with the previous two methods. Next, we'll learn about how to use 3D referencing in Excel. In Excel, a 3D reference is a reference that refers to the same cell across multiple worksheets. 3D references can be very useful when you have multiple worksheets on a workbook that use the same pattern or layout for their data, and you want to consolidate or summarize the data on those worksheets. In these situations, 3D referencing may be a perfect solution. Let's see an example. Here we have a workbook which contains four worksheets. The first three worksheets in the workbook contain viewership information for three different animated shows during a particular year. 2011, 2012, and 2013. Notice that the structure or layout of these three worksheets is identical. Put another way, the values located in specific cells on these worksheets have the same meaning or purpose from worksheet to worksheet. For example, the value in cell B4 on each worksheet refers to the average number of viewers per episode for the animated show South Park during that particular year. This sort of identical structure from worksheet to worksheet is required in order to use 3D referencing effectively. The final worksheet contained in our workbook is a summary worksheet, and this is the worksheet that we will use to consolidate or summarize the data appearing on the 2011 through 2013 worksheets. The general idea with 3D referencing is to refer to a range of worksheets in an Excel workbook in the same way that we can refer to a range of cells on a worksheet. Just as a range of cells refers to a continuous set of adjacent cells, the worksheets that we want to use for our 3D references must also be adjacent to each other on the workbook. In our example, the 2011, 2012, and 2013 worksheets are located next to one another on the workbook. That is, no other worksheets appear between these three worksheets. Given that our three worksheets meet this adjacency criterion, let's see how to use 3D referencing. To begin, notice that the viewership numbers for the TV shows Archer, 
South Park, and Futurama appear in cells B3, B4, and B5 on each worksheet. With this in mind, let's proceed to the summary worksheet. Column B on the summary worksheet is intended to contain the overall average number of viewers per episode for each of the three animated series. This means that we want to know the average number of viewers for each series from 2011 through 2013. To calculate these values, we can use 3D references. Beginning with the overall average viewership for Archer, and recalling that the yearly viewership numbers for Archer are contained in cell B3 on the 2011 through 2013 worksheets, we can compute the overall average by passing a 3D reference into the average function. We do this by specifying the range of worksheets that we want the average function to include in its calculations, as well as the specific cell on these worksheets whose value we want the average function to use. Just as when we specify a range of cells, we specify a range of worksheets by using the colon character. In this example, we are telling the average function that we want to include worksheets 2011 through 2013 in its calculations. We then type an exclamation point, followed by the reference to the cell whose value we want the average function to use. In this example, we are telling the average function to use the values contained in cell B3 on each worksheet in the selected range. When we close the function and press Enter, Excel will use the 3D reference to calculate the answer that we want. In this case, we can see that from 2011 through 2013, the overall average number of viewers per episode of Archer was 1,242,538. By using the fill handle to drag our formula down the column, Excel will quickly calculate the overall average number of viewers per episode for South Park and Futurama as well. Using a similar approach, we can also quickly calculate the highest and lowest average number of yearly viewers per episode for Archer by using a 3D reference in conjunction with the max and min functions. After completing these tasks, we can easily calculate the yearly viewership range by subtracting the lowest average number of yearly viewers from the highest average number of yearly viewers. In this example, we see that between 2011 and 2013, the yearly average viewership numbers for Archer varied by 339,615 viewers. Having completed these three formulas, we can now use the fill handle to drag the formulas down their respective columns in order to compute the analogous values for the animated series South Park and Futurama. Finally, let's learn how to use conditional formatting in Microsoft Excel. In Excel, conditional formatting can be used to automatically format the appearance of cells on a worksheet. To use conditional formatting, we must create one or more rules. In the context of conditional formatting, a rule checks whether the value of a cell meets a specified condition. If the condition is met, Excel will automatically format the appearance of the cell according to our preferences. Let's see a few examples of conditional formatting in Microsoft Excel. This worksheet contains viewership data for three different animated series over the course of three years. As our first example of conditional formatting, let's ask Excel to automatically apply some colored data bars to the overall average viewership numbers in column B. To do this, we first select all of the values in column B, after which we click on the Conditional Formatting drop-down box on the Home ribbon. We then select the Data Bars option, and for our example, I will use a green gradient fill. As we can see, 
Excel has added green bars to the background of each cell. The width of each bar allows us to easily see how the value in each cell compares to all of the other values in the column. In our current example, we can easily see that South Park has the greatest number of viewers per episode, while the viewership numbers for Archer and Futurama are somewhat similar to each other. Next, let's see an example of how to use conditional formatting with a custom rule. In our scenario, let's imagine that a potential advertiser wants to limit her risk by purchasing advertising only on shows whose viewership numbers have been reasonably stable over time. The advertiser can quickly identify the shows whose viewership numbers have been unstable by using conditional formatting with a custom cell highlighting rule. To begin, we'll select all of the values in column E, which represent the range of viewership for each show over time. Next, we'll click on the Conditional Formatting drop-down box, select Highlight Cells Rules, and then, for our purposes, let's choose the Greater Than option. When the Greater Than Conditional Formatting dialog box appears, we can tell Excel to automatically format the appearance of any cells whose values are greater than a particular threshold. For our purposes, let's establish a threshold of 500,000 viewers. Then tell Excel to use a light red fill on any cells that meet our criterion. When I click on the OK button, Excel automatically highlights any cells in the selected range whose values exceed our threshold of 500,000 viewers. In this case, we can see that the cell associated with South Park has been highlighted in light red. If we were to change the values of any of the other cells in column E, such that they exceeded our threshold of 500,000 viewers, we would see that Excel would also automatically highlight that cell in light red. As you can see, Conditional formatting can be a very useful way of gaining visual insights into the data on a worksheet. Excel provides many more conditional formatting options than those that were demonstrated here, so I encourage you to explore these options on your own. I'm sure you will quickly discover just how flexible and useful conditional formatting can be. Well, my friends, Thus ends our overview of working with multiple worksheets and using conditional formatting in Microsoft Excel. I hope that you learned something interesting in this video, and until next time, have a great day.